Hi everybody, I am Pamela Waldrop Shaw and I will be so happy when I see some acknowledgement that you're there. You know, we had a little technology issues last time, so I'm going to make sure <laughs> that we are on and good to go. Let's see, it says I'm live. Okay, that is good to see. Happy Sunday and Happy New Year. The last time I connected with you was on December 26th in an effort to jumpstart your 2017 and have a massive goal setting session with you. So I'm sure you have your design book all set up and that you have your 90 day goal clearly in mind and that you're in a good solid 30 days already, one third of the way in your process. How does that feel? Woohoo! Congratulations! So, I want to review a couple things with you. If you're just joining me, feel free to share this with your family and friends. Share it to your wall. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some reminders about the design book, and then we are going to tweak and refine some of the processes to make your next 60 of your last 90 uh, days super successful. How does that sound? Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm Pamela Shaw, and I'm coming to you today as the author of The 90 Day Design Your Life Planner, and I'm so excited about what I'm bringing you today. Okay, so let's review. You can change anything in 90 days. Anything. You can change anything in 90 days. You can change your body. You can change your marriage. You can change your business, your career. Anything you want to change, you can change in 90 days of sustained, committed, tenacious, focused effort and perseverance. And that's what we're going to walk through. You number Another principle of review, you can't change what you won't acknowledge. Another principle for review, time invested in one area is time away from another. Time invested in one area is time away from another. In fact, my distraction today delays my promotion tomorrow. So how are you doing applying those truths? Those are really just the three basic ones that I'm going to run with you on in the design planner in general because they are tried and true. You can change anything in 90 days. Number two, you can't change what you won't acknowledge. And number three, time invested in one area is time away from another. So how are you applying these truths? If by chance you have not watched the pre-teaching to this, I invite you to go to PamelaShaw.Pink and sign up on our mailing list and start out in the video series. The first two are just general instructions about the 90-day principles and the 90-day process and why the design book versus a traditional day timer. A reminder is, is this, you do not need to strengthen the habit of writing down appointments. You don't, need, you don't need to strengthen the habit of writing down appointment slots. You're looking for behavioral and habit changes to advance your success outcome. So using the planner, using the 90-day planner, it's a different way of thinking about personal growth. It's a more honest look at time investment. So when you see your life success as a journey, and the steps along the way as a process, then you will be more self-forgiving, but you'll also be more adventurous and better able to frame the ups and downs as lessons and part of the experience that point you towards success and away from repetitive misses. We want to point you towards success and away from repetitive misses. And so the 90-day uh, goal-setting video that uh, I did for you on December 26th, it's actually an hour and a half on PamelaShaw.Pink. It's one of the most comprehensive goal-setting classes that I've ever taught. And then the 30-minute pre-instructional video is also posted for that. They both would be super advantageous. If you didn't watch them, they would be a great uh, complement to what I'm going to do today. But all of those videos serve uh, a purpose, which is why they are in the video section on PamelaShaw.Pink. Okay, so today, here's what we're going to do. Today, there are three things and maybe four if there's enough time, if I can stay on course and stay focused with you. The three things we're going to do today, the first one is, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> we're going to take the 90-day goal to the 30-day goal to this week to this minute. See, a lot of people can take a 90-day goal. They just can't bring it down to this minute. They can take a 90-day goal to a 60-day goal to a 30-day goal to the week. They just can't take it down to this minute. 
And so people fail because they get the goal and they bring it all the way down. They just don't know what to do in this minute. So today we're going to talk about 90 to now. And then the second thing we're going to talk about is the end of the week. How do you recalibrate? How do you this is a critical piece. It's a critical success piece of the Design Your Life Planner. And I'm so excited about giving you this piece today because what do you what you do at the end of the week and how you look back and how you look forward, it really does determine your success. So uh, it's a critical piece of the map and how to recalibrate. That's going to be part number two. The third part that I'm going to share with you today is about the mission statement. If I have one question that has happened, that has come to me more in the last, I don't know, six months since I've been doing more trainings on this, it's, what is a mission statement? How do I write my mission statement? Why do I need a mission statement? And so we're going to talk about that. And then if there is time, the ever mysterious, am I doing it right affirmation. Okay? Sound like a plan? Those are our four. Okay, so I'm getting ready to go. If you'd like to share this with your family and friends, I would be honored. Just hit your share button. It'll share it to your wall, and they can start back at the very beginning. And um, this is going to be about 30, 35 minutes. Ready? Okay. So from 90 to now, what does that look like? From 90 days till now, now this minute is the success link to the 90-day result that you're desiring. This very minute, that goal that you want. I've asked you before, what do you want now? What do you want most? There will always be a gap between what you want to do right now and what you want to have most. What do you want now? What do you want most? There will always be that gap because there is the emotional of what I feel like doing now versus the what I want most, the deep thought, the actual what am I doing with my life. There's always a gap between what I feel like doing right now and what I say that I want to do most. So... We've got to look at whether we want to live in the point of gratification. You know, I just like doing, I like doing what I feel like doing. I just want to do what I feel like doing. Versus the uncomfortableness and the inconvenience of stretching or growing. The 90 day to now success goal has to do with recognizing those two places of tension. What I feel like doing now, not a whole lot what I feel like doing, what I want most. What I want most is a continual uh, growing and living out of my God called vision. Isn't that what you want most? Don't you want more than anything to live in the amazingness of the life you were given? What God has called you to, what he has gifted you to, the abundance. When, when, we, when we hear about the the opportunity to live an abundant life. Don't you really want to live in the abundance of the life God has called you to? So in general human beings, we tend to move towards pleasure and away from pain. So what I feel like doing now contrasted with what choice will advance me towards completing my goal, therein lies the secret. So there are really two components. The first is have I accurately broken down the goal into bite-sized steps? Has my 90-day goal, has it been broken down into bite-sized steps, behaviors, actions, tasks, efforts, choices? From the 90-day result that I want to the end of the month measuring stick, have I taken it from 90 days to 60 days to a month? Let me restate, what is my 90-day goal? I'm going to give you an example. Okay, let's say my 90 day goal is to lose 24 pounds. That means I would be on course with an eight pound loss each month. If I keep it at an even loss and that's the healthiest, that would be two pounds a week. So 3,500 calories equals a pound. So for the week, I have to have a 7,000 calorie deficient in order to lose two pounds. Now, if I have muscle mass goals or other goals with that weight loss, I have to factor more things in. I would also need the counsel of a true professional, food and exercise science, uh, perhaps the addition of a physician who gauges my hormone balance, and, and there, there could be so much more. But So for the sake of simplicity, we'll keep it at the calorie conversation because that all sounds really great and simple, right? So until you get hungry and you go for a familiar grab. All of that sounds really simple. I need to lose. I, I'm not saying I do. I'm using it as an example. If the goal is 24 pounds weight loss in 90 days, then that's 8 pounds a month, and that's 2 pounds a week. 
So all I need to do is eat 7,000 fewer calories and or create activity to, to adjust for that 7,000 calorie deficient. That sounds great. That makes sense. I got that until I get hungry. <laughs> I got that until I get hungry. And then I don't have a plan and then I go for a familiar grab, right? And so you don't know the calories, the carbs, the protein, the fat, or the sugar values. You don't care because you, you're hungry and you're going to eat your snack no matter what because it satiates. So you, you go into justify mode. Well, how many calories could it be? I mean, that little bit won't make a difference. You haven't changed any behaviors. You haven't prepared any differently. You aren't thinking any differently. You aren't any more accountable than you were. So now you're devastated when it's Sunday and you weigh and you're plus 0.5 pounds. <laughs> you set a goal. You know that you wanna lose 24 pounds and you wanna lose two pounds this week, but you gained a half a pound. Why? Because you didn't go, you didn't do the back steps for the goal. You didn't go back to assure that all of the winning components were there. What do I mean by back steps? Well, it's preparation. And I'm sure you've heard me say, when opportunity presents itself, it's too late to get prepared. So let me kind of give you a funny twist of that. When I'm starving, it's too late to get prepared. It's too late to have a good choice. If, I haven't, if I'm not prepared and I'm starving, it's too late to get prepared. So let's backstep this goal. Okay, I'm going to walk you through this. You'll be so tired of hearing about losing two pounds this week. We're going to walk through this. Because I'm uh, here, here's the thing, okay? If what I've been eating and the way I've been exercising or not has continually added unwanted weight on my body, then what changes in my eating patterns and activity status need adjusting? Now, we are at a principle I hold steadfastly to in Design Your Life. You can't change what you won't acknowledge. So let's just stop it right there. In the pursuit of your goal and in the pursuit of your dream, what are you choosing not to acknowledge? What piece of it you, do you already know could go differently if you were actually being truthful with yourself? What are you not acknowledging? So in order to get this honestly, you probably need to jot down back to the, to the lose two pounds this week goal. You probably need to jot down what you're currently eating for several days in a row or think back through, which is not reliable. If I think back through what I ate compared to what I wrote down that I ate, it is usually a little bit different. <laughs> My memory is nicer to me than the actual black and white of a paper. So paper and ink. And I'll tell you what, I'm really big on, and I'm going to keep it on the weight loss goal because it's universal and everybody can relate to health and fitness. I am really big on not using an app until you learn the quantities of food. You need hand to brain to learn the process, to write it out, to write it down. And um, I strongly, strongly recommend this. Um, and there's a, a reason, there's a brain and mechanical reason behind it. My buddy Angio and I designed a uh, tra food tracking journal years ago. And um, in fact, there, we still have them on charismafactor.com if you want a great food tracking journal and learning tool. Uh, but having to learn and do the math and taking ownership in the decisions that you're making and in the foods that give you the most protein value for the carb fat effect, you've got to back step in order to take ownership in making a good choice in the minute. Does this make sense? Give me a little feedback back there. Okay, so number two back step. Number one back step is just acknowledging if what I've been eating has been adding weight and making me unhealthier, then I've got to do something about that. So the number two back step is what resource would give you the best information that you could digest? That's what I'm talking about. Well, you know, what's the best resource for you to get good information on this topic? There are people who know this. Where are you going to get the information? Well, at your gym, I'm telling you, there's somebody who looks extraordinary. There's somebody who looks amazing. Ask him. Ask her. What is a typical food day for you? How many grams of protein do you eat? How about grams of fat, carbs, sugar, fiber? How often do you work out? Do you always do weights? How much cardio do you do? Do you do full body exercises? Read, ask questions, and become a student if you want to be successful in this arena. 
Maybe your role model isn't at the gym at all. Maybe it's just a relative or a neighbor or a workmate or somebody who just looks good in their clothes and they look healthy and you, that's the look you're after. Regardless, ask the person that you want to learn from what the keys are. I have read and have always kept a book on nutrition going. It reminds me of what's happening at the cellular level. It's more than just about a size. It's about a healthy way of life. And so the reason that I stay in a book is because I don't trick myself into thinking that certain foods are okay or certain habits are okay. I stay reminded on the truth. Now, I'm using this goal. It could be any goal. It could be a career goal. It could be uh, it could be an earning goal. It could be a debt reduction goal. It could be a business building goal. It could be an, a goal accomplishment. It could be anything, but the process is still the same. The one is acknowledge that where you are is the result you have based on the way you've been doing things. And then get honest with yourself because you can't change what you won't acknowledge. And then your next back step goal is to find someone who has the results that you want and then follow those steps. Um, people ask me a lot what I read in terms of nutrition. And I oftentimes don't make recommendations about books. The first book I ever read was Beyond Pritikin. And it's the first time that I actually understood what's going on inside the body on a scientific level. A book that I've read two or three times about that same thing is a book by Dr. Hyman called Ultra Metabolism. Again, there, science, because the body is science and it's changing all the time, there's always something amazing out there. But you want to, uh, you want to get informed. And then number three, how often do I eat? compared to how often do healthy people eat. You know what I find? Usually when I find somebody who's battling with their weight, what they'll say is something like, you know, I only eat once a day. Really? <laughs> Your body needs fuel. And so if you ask fit people how often they eat, they're going to give you a different answer. And that answer is going to be somewhere between three and six times a day, probably on average. Okay, so number four, what would your perfect day look like? I'm giving you the steps to creating a successful right now that takes a lot of backtracking. So how often do I want to eat compared to how often am I eating? Number four, what would a perfect day look like? Breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. What would a perfect day look like? Because if I don't know what a perfect day looks like, I don't have a chance of living one. So what would a perfect day look like and when would I plan that out and prepare differently? Number five, what in my current diet, lifestyle, what has to go? What has to go? Time of day, eating, food, snack, thinking, what, thinking the way I think about food, the way I think about exercise, the way I justify. In order for me to lose 24 pounds in 90 days, 8 pounds a month, 2 pounds this week, the number four thing is, what would a perfect day look like? Breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, and what, when would I prepare all that? And then number five, what in my current plan has to go? Number six, when do I eat? Am I hungry, sad, mad, emotional, lonely, disappointed, happy, social? When do I currently eat? Number seven, what foods drain my energy? Have I ever noticed what foods drain my energy? Have I noticed what foods make me in a good mood? Have I noticed what foods put me in a down mood? What foods put me to sleep? What foods wake me up? What foods do I eat when I wake up the next day and I feel amazing? Um, have I ever noticed that food makes a difference in the way I feel? <laughs> Number eight, what triggers me to want more food or more of something or revert to old choices? What triggers me to go to old bad habits, uh, the old behaviors more than pushing forward to create my new habit, the, the new character trait, the new result? What's triggering me to go back instead of forward. Number nine, how does sleep play into all this? Does sleep have anything to do with weight loss? Um, and you have to work that all the way around the spectrum of backtracking. If, if you have to backtrack, you could, you might need to backtrack about your sleep. Number 10, I know this is a bad one. How does exercise play into this? How does exercise play into this? And number 11, how does this choice affect the rest of my schedule? How does this choice of food, I mean, is my whole life going to be built around food now just to lose two pounds a month? How's this going to play into the rest of my schedule? And then number 12, how will I be accountable? How will I be accountable? You know, people with acknowledged addictions who 
reference themselves as being in recovery, they are encouraged to change their people, places, and things. People, places, and things. So sometimes when you're working on accomplishing a goal, you also need to change your people, places, and things. And they're encouraged to change that forever because broke people know each other. Fit people gather together. Successful people have successful friends. So see, if you're trying to make a change, the reality is simply that you're going to have to gather with other people making similar changes. I will tell you this, coming from um, a, a, a parent in the addiction and recovery world, and my son always gives me permission to share this in the event that it might benefit or help someone else. People who are in recovery talk about recovery. They will tell you how much sobriety they have. They will bring it up. They will tell you how many months, how many years. They have benchmark celebrations. They celebrate with their other friends who are in recovery. They're not embarrassed about it. It's how they stay on course. It's a big piece of it. If you know somebody who's um, trying to get through something or get over something, but there's no conversation about it, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you already know the answer because accountability and conversation about the direction you're going, that is the community and that is a key to success. People alike who are doing the same thing. That's why we do life together. We're supposed to be connected. None of us is perfect. We're all working on something. And so the degree to which you actually humble yourself and make yourself transparent to be successful in an arena is how, is how successful you will or won't be. So these are just partial but good back steps. See, all of those steps just to lose two pounds? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. Uh, in order for me to have victory in 90 days, I've got to have great, intentional, foolproof plan today, right now. See, before, right before I came up here, I was hungry and I had not paid attention to when I last ate because unlike most days today, I had scheduled, but I had not fully scheduled when I would eat because I don't want to have nuts in my teeth when I come up here to get on the, so I had not eaten. In fact, I just I had kind of put my little tooth whitener on while I was getting dressed. And so I didn't want to mess my teeth up, but I was starving. And so I know, I knew I needed some protein before I came up here to give you the best of my time. So Guess what? I had a plan. I already had a plan in the refrigerator that was waiting for me. I didn't have to make a poor choice because I've already integrated this into my lifestyle. But integrating it takes a whole lot of work. So in order for me to have victory in 90 days, I've got to have great, intentional, foolproof success planned today and again tomorrow. It's, it's, it's not just, okay, I'll have a 7,000 calorie deficient and then you'll fail tomorrow. Success takes preparation. And that's why we're in the design book, people. That's why the design book is so important because it's a process and you've got to retrain your brain to go with that process to bring you the results that you want. Otherwise, you will go your entire lifetime with the results that you've been getting based on what you've been doing. So what goal of yours needs a little bit more groundwork? What goal that you've put in your 90-day planner needs a little bit of backtrack preparation. You can apply this process we just walked through. Lose 24 pounds in 90 days, eight pounds a month, two pounds a week, down to the choice today. We backtrack all of those thinking processes to get to that. You can take any goal and apply this process that you have your heart set on. 90 days, 30 days, one week, today, right now. This or that? right now. This or that, right now. It's the choice that you make in the moment. 90 days, whoo, I got 90 days. January, February, March, whoo, by the end of March, it'll be spring, it's gonna be exciting. 60 days into February, wow, by the end of February, I'll be. But if you do what you're doing, what you've been doing the whole time, if January, February, March, if you don't change, if you don't backtrack, March will come around, and you will be in the same place all over again because success takes preparation. So, what goal of yours needs a little bit more groundwork? This or that? Old habit, old habit, or the discomfort of a new behavior and a choice with accountability, tracking and recording. Make a note right now. Make a note right now. Hope you have your design book out. Make a note right now. How and what goal that you've set do you need to go back and do a little bit more work on, a little bit more preparation on, a little bit more backtracking on? 
because you're gonna reverse design your goal. See how I took that 24 pound weight loss down to eight pounds a month, down to two pounds a week, then the science of that is getting rid of 3,500 calories per pound, so that's 7,000 that I have to either sweat off or eat less <laughs> in order to have those two pounds go away. See how I did that? So you, I reverse designed the goal. I reverse set the goal. I brought it all the way back. But it's not just two, it's not just 7,000 calories this week. It's right now this choice. You can eat an elephant one bite at a time. You can eat an elephant one bite at a time. Did you know that you could eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> I used to think that was so strange, such a strange analogy, but you know, you get the message, right? What's the difference between next year and never? Today, right now. It's the accumulation effect. It's the little bite of the elephant. Okay, if you're enjoying this and you think it's something that your friends would enjoy and benefit from, hit that share button on your phone or your screen and pass it along. We're going to jump in to number the second part of this uh, Facebook Live mastery class. And it's called Recalibrate. I like the word. Say it out loud. Recalibrate. Is that kind of a cool word? <laughs> I think it's a cool word. I'm going to tell you what it means. Recalibrate. It's a verb. And it means to make small changes to an instrument so that it measures accurately. Recalibrate. It can cost $800 to recalibrate a pump. Okay? Another definition of recalibrate is to change the way you do or think about something. Now, ha, now we're getting somewhere. To recalibrate means to change the way you do or think about something. You need to recalibrate your expectations. Okay, I love this word. It's like become one of my favorite new words. It's not a new word, but it's become one of my favorite words that I like to say a lot. Recalibrate. Okay, I didn't use my posters today because, uh, well, for a lot of reasons. One, I was afraid of turning my phone around the correct way based on the 26, and I would need to have someone here, and that didn't work out again today. So um, I don't have my big pictures of the design book up, but if you're... Uh, if you have your design book open and with you, go to the end of a week. Go to the end of a seventh day because that's where I'm going to be referencing from this point forward. Okay. This is, this portion of your book is probably the least used yet one of the most effective processes of the entire design book. It's the end of the week and it is time to recalibrate. Oh, I love this. We need to recalibrate our expectations. Now, here's why the design book beats a day planner anytime. No planner gets you to the end of the week and invites you to brainiac through your processes. Think through what you did. Redesign. I mean, this part, I'm so excited about giving you this. I can hardly stand it. I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is, this is, this is the money. This is, this is where you spent your money on the book. It's right here at the end of the week when you're rethinking and readjusting where you're going. So it's, it's a self-imposed at the end of the week where you sit down and you have a little meeting with yourself and you inspect what you expect from me. I inspect what I expect from me. Nobody else involved. It's not a grade. I just get to do it. So why do people not do it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you all do this. I do this. Because we exaggerate our shortcomings. Oh my gosh. And then we diminish our success. We exaggerate what we didn't do. Oh, you know, and we tell ourselves all this horrible stuff, you know, about our failures and I can't count on myself and I did the same thing again and I can't believe I did this and I'm probably the only one in the world and crazy stuff. We, we exaggerate our shortcomings and we diminish our success. We don't loudly say, hey, I had 70 ounces of water every day. Okay, well, yay. You know what? That is a yay. I made 10 booking calls a day, five days in a row. Yay. So there, people are afraid of what they'll discover, so they don't ask themselves questions about themselves. It's kind of like, I'll just pretend like this didn't happen, this week didn't happen. Some people go back and actually erase days. Oh my word, don't get me started. You cannot have your head in the sand when it comes to your life. <clears throat> because it's just not going to work if you want different results. It's the end of the week at the end end of the 90 days, if you pay attention to the end of the week, every week, at the end of the 90 days, you're going to have a result that is going to blow your mind. And you know why I know? Because I get emails, texts, 
Facebook messages, Instagram post comments, all the time from people who take this process seriously, from people who are using the book and renovating their lives because they don't need to write down an appointment for where they'll be tomorrow. We all know how to keep an appointment. It's the process of who we're becoming and how we're adjusting by our own design, what God has called us to and what we're going to be and live out and how we're going to serve other people and make a difference in this world. So when you start over with a fresh design book at the end of 90 days, you write it all out again. That is the critical success to the design book. You write it all out again. You deepen the new thoughts and desires and habits in your brain by growing healthy branches in your brain to your thoughts and beliefs. So you want to take advantage of God's great design and the pliability of your brain. When you rewrite that out, you are literally redesigning your brain. When you rewrite it out and you, when you, when you literally put penmanship to your brain, your heart is engaged, your brain is engaged, your thoughts are engaged, your spirit is engaged. When you do that, you are literally rewriting, overwriting negative thoughts and rewriting your preferred thoughts, your preferred vision in your brain. So the 90-day process of the, of the design book, it literally goes along with the science that God has gifted us in our bodies because it invites you to write it out all over again. The end of the week is the micro process of having to start all over at the end of 90 days. I love when somebody gets a new 90-day planner and they're willing to sit down and take the hour or two hours to rewrite it all out. Oh, the, what do you mean you don't have time to do it? Of course you have time to do it. You don't have time not to do it unless you just want to waste your life and cruise through on the same place that you are right now. If you want to grow, if you want to become, if you want to develop, it's a priority to make time to do it. So I love the 90-day rework, but I love the end-of-the-week rework. Because at the end of the week, magic happens. So before another year gets away from me, let me just deal with these last seven days, right? Before another entire year gets away from me, I'm going to press pause and I'm going to deal with the last seven days. And I'm going to check myself and my progress. I'm not going to go a whole year and go, where'd this year go? I'm going to go seven days. And at the end of seven days, I'm going to open up my design book. And at the end of seven days, when I open up my design book, whew, I'm going to say, see, my, and mine's a mess, y'all. Mine is a, I, I wrote this thing and it's a mess. <laughs> so I'm going to reflect. I mean, look, this is a mess. This is called working it. I, as far as I know, none of you are going to get to see it or give me a grade. I am working it. I, so I'm going to get to the end of a week, and now I'm going to take time, and I'm going to give myself the time that it takes to sit down and start truly working the process. The end of the week, it's the micro process of the 90-day process. So before another year gets away from me, I'm going to take the seven days. Okay, if you, if you think what I'm getting ready to share about the end of the week is going to benefit some of your family and friends or your team, share the Share the Facebook Live by just hitting it, the share button on your phone or on your computer screen, because here we go. Okay, secret. I'm constantly thinking about how I'm going to edit the design book with every printing of it. I always have a blank book going where I'm making edits and changes and improvements in the book based on what I've learned, based on what I teach, based on what I read. And so I've got some really exciting edits in the motion right now that I just can hardly wait uh, to, to put in the next publication of it. I'm making notes right now. It won't be for a while, but I'm going to give you some of the very first developed concepts about the end of the week that are going to come in the next book. So, okay, um, I, I want to expound on the edits with you in this conversation and invite you to really work the end of the week. Are you going to work the end of the week? If I tell you, will you really work the end of the week? Promise. Will you sit down this afternoon and do your own time, your end of the week? If I, if I give you these next edits and, and kind of give you a little bit of more information? Okay. Well, here's what we're going to do at the end of the week. Oh, the pink, uh, the pink leather folio holder. Is that so awesome? It's on charismafactor.com. Oh, I love it. Yep, charismafactor.com. Okay, end of the week, here we go. You promising, okay, I see you promise. Okay, write all these R words down because here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna reflect. 
Somebody, will somebody write these down on here for me and make a create a comment? Write all these R words down in the next comment. Okay, K, write them down. We're going to reflect, realign, review, reprioritize, rewrite, redesign, and recommit. Okay? I'll say them again. We're going to reflect, realign, review, reprioritize, rewrite, redesign, and recommit. Can you stand it? We're going to do all those things at the end of the week. Okay. So, the, this end of the week process, it's, it's the key that separates what most people do in goal setting from world-class winners and success from the masses. It is the key that separates what most people do in goal setting from what world-class winners and successes do from the masses. Not too much time gets away. Seven days. Seven days. There's time for correction and increased results if you only go seven days and then evaluate. The end of the week process, it has to have a time slot on your calendar. So today, five o'clock, whatever. You, you select the time. It's, you, you can't just put it on your list. If you put it on your list, then you become a list maker and you, you only have lists. If you put a time slot on your calendar where you sit down to do this kind of thinking, writing, investigating, this is the money in your life. An appointment with yourself. It's a critical investment of time versus just setting appointments for next week. This appointment that you're going to set with yourself, oh my gosh, this is the appointment of the week. The rest of the appointments, you know what to do when you get to your work appointments. You know what to do when you get to your selling appointments or interview appointments. This piece is going to set you apart from everybody else. So although your appointments are important and they're also critical to the success business growth that you want to have, you're going to attend them on time. That, however, could go on for a lifetime, you just attending appointments on time, but never accomplish personal growth or accomplish intentional goals. So this weekly pause is your secret weapon. Are you excited? I'm excited. Okay, reflect, realign, review, reprioritize, rewrite, redesign and recommit. Let's talk about reflect. That's the first thing we're going to do. Now, if you're at the end of your design book, you're going to want to write some of these things down because they're not written there now. I'm giving them to you from my own experience and from my own years of doing this process, and I will ultimately get them edited. Well, they're being edited, but right now you're going to write them down. Under the reflect section, maybe some of you want to... Um, Write down these questions on the chat, if you would. Under the reflect question, what did I do well? What did I do well? Answer that. What were my wins? How did I win this week? What were, what were my wins? What do I feel good about? What surprised me this week? What am I proud of this week? What caught me off guard this week? Where did I drop the ball? Did I throw in the towel? What caused that? What is my big aha this week? Did I have a big like, boo, light bulb? What's my big aha? What did I learn this week? What am I grateful for? We're reflecting. That reflection and all those questions what did I do well? What were my wins? What do I feel good about? What surprised me? What am I proud of? What caught me off guard? Where did I drop the ball? Where did I give up? What's my big aha? What did I learn this week? What am I grateful for? That reflection is so beneficial to your process just to give yourself the opportunity to actually walk through thinking those things out loud. Don't be afraid of what you're going to find. Only be afraid of not sitting down to ask yourself the questions. Okay, next, realign. Realign. By realign, what I mean is, let's just recalibrate a little bit. This whole process is recalibration, but realign is, you know, if, you're, if you've got a tire on your car that's kind of wompy jump, your car is going to drive stupid. It's going to drive. It's going to try to, it's going to pull over to the left. You're trying to keep it on the right. It's pulling over to the left. You're trying to keep it on the right. And really all you need is a real quick, you know, probably free car alignment with your tires. So we're going to, 
here you are in your business and you're like getting off course mm, getting off course you probably just need a really quick realignment so what do I mean by realignment okay realign for all those things I just said what's a fix that comes to mind what is a fix that comes to mind what needs tweaking changing or adjusting what needs tweaking changing or adjusting what does that look like in terms of behavior what behavior needs to be adjusted is there a habit that needs some implementing is there a habit that needs implementing what about accountability realign yourself your thoughts your expectations your game plan and your goal okay now it's time to review I love review okay review go back to the beginning of your design book and look at the goals that you've written down look at the goals at the front of your planner long-term goals short-term goals the 90-day goals the benchmark goals end of the month the end of the week goals does anything need to be tweaked here's the thing if I say one thing but I believe another there is a cognitive dissonance in my brain literally this is a fact and when there is a cognitive dissonance in my brain I shut down and I will not advance so I've got to look at these goals and I've got to be super honest because one of two things must adjust I must either adjust my behavior or I need to tweak or adjust my goal so which is it back to the very beginning what do I want what do I want most what do I want now so am I willing to adjust my behavior my week what I'm finding out about asking myself these questions or do I need to adjust my goal one or the other okay review now I'm gonna ask you to rewrite just rewrite one to two of your goals this week in that go back to the end of the week section just rewrite it out in your own mind what is the goal number one what is the goal number two what is the goal just rewrite out maybe two of your most important goals sincerely and completely and give those two goals this week just those two your greatest intention your design book is not for someone else to be impressed by. It is not for a grade. I will most likely never see it. This is your brain and your future on paper. Be genuine with yourself. Don't play around with your brain. A convinced mind succeeds. A convinced mind succeeds. So rewrite your one to two goals and then write down this week, what are my top three things? What are the top three things that I'm going to do this week no matter what? What are the top three things? Write those three things down. Now we're going to reprioritize, okay? We're still at the end of the week. Are you with me? What do you think? We good? Okay. End of the week, we're going to reprioritize. Let's do some practical things first. Let's go back and look at last week and check the past week for tasks or efforts or undone things and uh, evaluate them. So was there somebody you were supposed to call, text, write, book, follow up on? Go back and reprioritize. Look and see if anything was undone that you want to bring into this week. And then, real quickly, go to your master task list. This is the very beginning of your book. It's where you did your brain dump in the beginning so that you're making lists of things that you want to do, but not right now. You just want to keep them on your mind. You don't want them to run around in your brain and drive you crazy, so that's why those lists exist. And just real quickly look at your master task list, personal and business. See if there's anything from either of those lists that belong in this week. Usually, oftentimes, there's not, but it's just good to reprioritize just take a real quick look okay now next what will make this week write this question down after you've we're reprioritizing so you go back and check the task that's already written in your design book for you to do check your master list that's written in your design book for you to do this is a new question that I want you to write down what will make this week a winning week what will make this week a winning week and then when you go back look at that answer and then back to your top two goals I want you to write down what's the one thing 
that will make a difference in my top two goals. How will I honor my top two goals this week? In my daily choices, in my words, in my task, what's the one thing that I will do for each of my top goals that if I did this one thing, it would make everything else irrelevant or unnecessary? So back to my top two goals. I'm still, I'm still in the reprioritize stage. If I've narrowed it down to these two goals, what's the one thing that if I do this, it will make everything work and it will make everything else still unnecessary? And then the last thing, jot down here, what's a skill that I'm learning and practicing this week? Give yourself permission to be in learning mode. What's the skill that you're working on or practicing this week? Now I have to set my intention. And this comes down to the smallest denomination of the split second choice, okay? Key behaviors. Key behaviors. What do I mean by that? Well, what key behaviors do I want to invest in living this week? Let me give you an example. Um, for me, a key behavior is when I get up, and that's usually right around 5.30, um, sometime between 5 and 5.45, but it's right in there at 5 because one of my evening affirmations is I set my alarm at 5.45, but I easily awake before it rings. Do you know the number of days that I wake up 15 minutes before that alarm rings because I have set my mind to that at night. A key behavior is in my room with blackout curtains, all the lights off, no blue lights on. I keep a fan on for the sound to be constant. That's a key behavior. A key behavior is when I wake up in the morning, um, there are certain things that I do, but one key behavior that for me is successful is not looking at technology until I have really invested in my quiet time, prayer, journaling, Bible study. For me, that's a key behavior. Another key behavior for me is not grabbing at nuts. I love nuts. I love almonds and peanuts and pistachios and macadamias. And I love a mix of them with some good organic dried cherries in there. Oh, it's like a big old peanut butter sandwich like in my mouth. And I love when I'm busy just grabbing some nuts. They make me really heavy. <laughs> Because they're like, how many calories could be in that? Well, if you actually do the math on it, you'll see a lot. Anything wrong with a nut? No, not when it's gauged and measured and accounted for. But for me, a key behavior is not grabbing because it doesn't accomplish, it doesn't fit in with the other goals that I have. So I'm giving you some ideas for key behaviors. So what key behaviors do you want to include in this week? Because you need to write them down. You need to write them down. In fact, I, may, I think where I'm going to put them in the next book is at the end of each week, there's a blank page, like a page by itself. I would encourage you to write down, you know, what are the two or three key behaviors? And then give yourself a check every day that you hit those behaviors. Again, this is your Design Your Life Planner. You fill in the blanks. You make it work for you. You put stickies on it. You put tabs on it. You divide it. You own it because there are only blanks in it. You get to design it. And so what key behaviors do you want to invest in this week? Don't make a list of 10. You know, I mean, just yesterday or three days ago, I just said to myself again, I'm not grabbing nuts. Not grabbing nuts. It's a key behavior I'm going to give myself for a window of time. Um, yeah. So, number seven. Number seven, there are three things you want to write, three words you want to write down. Is there anything that I can eliminate, delegate, automate? Is there anything I can eliminate, delegate, or automate? Eliminate. What do I need to get off my plate? What, can, what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to delegate? Give to someone else? Hire someone else? Use another outsource person? What about, what do I need to automate? What am I doing that really could just be a system that's like that? And the answers may be no, no, and no. It may be no, no, and no. But you're gonna ask yourself at the end of every week because you wanna be uh, investing your time maximally. You wanna be giving the very best of yourself to the very highest level leveraged activities that are gonna bring you the 90 day goal back. Okay, that's number seven. Now, we're going to redesign. Redesign. I'm going to redesign your week by recreating your weekly plan sheet, Sunday through Saturday. And then you're going to pick up your sticky pad, your yellow sticky pad, and you're going to put one on every day of the week. I mean, I have mine, you know, here's my, here's my Tuesday coming up, and I don't have my whole Tuesday scheduled, but I've got enough of it scheduled that I've got a good bit of my sticky pad already on there and ready to go. So put a sticky pad on for each day. And then 
Your to-do is just a list until it gets an appointment slot on your day. To-do lists, they are just a mess. They're just gonna keep accumulating until they get an appointment slot, an actual time slot on your day. So design your six most things for tomorrow. That's the redesign, just redesign it all. Redesign your weekly plan sheet, redesign tomorrow all the way, redesign the other days as far out as you can, and then the last R, recommit. In the recommitment, maybe review your affirmations. You know, maybe say your affirmations out loud. I know you're doing them in the morning and preferably uh, on a recording, but maybe just review and read those again. And um, you're ready to go. Okay, so what do you think about what do you think about all those R's? Reflect, realign, review, rewrite, reprioritize, redesign, and recommit. Okay, this is a big piece in this middle. Let's move to the mission statement. I think I'm running out of time. Oops, I'm more. Oh, I'm running way out of time. I'm sorry. Okay. We're, we're moving to mission statement. <laughs> uh, let's move into mission statement. I get so many questions about this that I really want to address it fast. So for those of you who have blank pages on your mission statements or you have no idea what to write, I know it drives you nuts. So I want to give you some guidance. Back in the 80s and the 90s, really for the first time ever, corporations started considering what their mission statements were were, why they were doing what they were doing. They realized that there would be more buy-in from their employees, um, school teachers, students, workers, if there was a unifying why. Why are we doing this? It's a statement. Uh, Mary Kay Incorporated, for example, uh, mission statement, we exist to enrich the lives of women. We do this through our products and career opportunity. The Mary Kay Ash Charitable Foundation um, uh, functions to eradicate cancers that affect women and eliminate situation effects that come from domestic violence. Um, we have clear-cut whys as a part of the mission statement. So, um, so often we shout out our what. What I want. What I see. Here's what. Here's what. But and that's important. Knowing what is important. That vision piece of what you want, that's important. The front part of your design book invites that first. You know, it, it has you write down in my wildest dreams and it really gets you thinking about your bucket list and the thing that you want this year and the thing that you want most. It gets you thinking. That's your, that is your what, your vision. But then the, the page where you really write out what you want, what do you see? You know, what would make this your best year ever? Remember all those questions we went through? Uh, what are the top 10 things you'd like to see and accomplish and experience this year? If you haven't watched the pre-workshop to the 90-minute 2017 goal-setting session from December 26th, go to PamelaShaw.pink and re-watch that. It's worth taking the time to write all of that out. Um, so, but your mission statement is your why. Your mission statement is your why. So, why do you want the results and the outcomes that you say you want? Why do you want them? Okay, so here are some questions that you're going to start writing down and writing the answers to. What drives you? What is the biggest need you have? So you're asking myself, what drives me? What's the biggest need that I have? How do I want to live my life? What do I value? Somebody might want to write these questions down in the chat part. So, um, what drives me? What's the biggest need that I have? What do I value? How do, you, how do I want to contribute? What do I want to accomplish? How do I define success? I mean, just write it out. How do I define success? How do you define success? Write and write and write. What, is success, what does a successful life mean? look to, look like to me? What does a successful life look like to me? What is success to me? What do I want to be known by? What words would describe the best version of me? And you write and you write and quite frankly, you may go through two to three years of design books before you narrow these thoughts down to a paragraph that makes sense to you. Um, before you actually get a mission statement. I've always worked on customizing one for my personal life and one for my professional life. Um, in, in my early marriage, I worked on one that reflected what I wanted my marriage to look like, what I wanted our home to look and feel and smell and be and sound like, what I wanted parenting to look and sound like, service, 
um, and then one for my business. What did I? What what drove my leadership? What would what would I define myself as a successful leader? What's success to me as a leader? And although I don't necessarily think you have to have two mission statements or a long perfect paragraph. I do think that by processing and thinking and working through these thoughts and weighing what you really think, not the group vote of your family or other people or what they've told you that you are or what you should think or do or what it should look like, I think you taking the time to really go through this is an important process of getting comfortable in your skin and wearing confidence as your best outfit. Okay, your vision is your what, this is what I want. Your mission is your why. This is why I want it. And the why aligns with your values, how you see yourself in this world. This past January, I shared with some of our very top leaders in Mary Kay at a conf our leadership conference in January. When your what and your why have alignment and agreement, how becomes a piece of cake. When your what and your why have alignment, and agreement. How you do what you do, it's a piece of cake. How's not even a question. Most people are always asking, how? How do I do this? How do I do that? How do I do this? How do I do that? Now, when your what is strong and your why is clear, how? There are a billion ways of how to do something. Your what and your why create fewer steps. People often ask how, but in reality, how is a product of your what and your why. You will always figure out how. Okay, I'm going to read you a couple of affirmations. Uh, I mean, a, a couple of things in my mission statement just to be transparent and to give you a better um, idea of what I'm talking about here. For those of you who ask me how much time I spend at the end of a week, keep in mind I've been doing this for 20 years. It's been my own journey, my own process. And so um, it, it, will, it probably won't take me quite as long at the end of a week as it might take you while you're learning the process. Um, but... Um, the, I spend about an hour at the end of every week to recalibrate and review and reflect and reprioritize, realign, redesign, review. I spend about an hour every week. And then one question I think that I grabbed, um, it, honestly, it takes me a minute to grab, so I don't, gra <laughs> I don't grab most of the comments. I will go back and read them all later. And I, I thank you for those. I'm fed by those. The hearts, I'm fed by those. I'm fed by your words. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, and I will get back, and if, if there's opportunity for me to answer questions, I will. But um, uh, I, I spend about an hour and then, you know, get everything set back up again. Another question, though, was how do you deal with the interruptions of life? Girl, if I could tell you about my week this last week. <laughs> uh, you would think interruption, right? Um, we all have interruptions. We all have surprise. We all have disappointment. Oh, thank you for those hearts. See, I just needed to tell you that I liked them. I love them. Thank you. <laughs> um the we all have things that go wrong somebody gets sick or a child goes in a different direction or your parents need some support or a neighbor needs help or you get sick or um there are as many surprises in the week ahead for each of us more than we have time to even guess and the beauty of it is if you're standing on your faith that you know that god is in charge of all your circumstances nothing comes into my life but that it gets past god first so that means that if i stand on my faith and if i'm really going to live my faith even though the circumstances are went a little awry not what i would have picked i have to trust that what god is bringing me is something better and more superior in my life and that hiccup is an opportunity for me just to learn and stretch my faith and practice what I preach. I just get to a chance, an opportunity to practice what I preach. Um, I like when things go smoothly, but you, you, you adjust, you know, you just adjust. Um, so I'm going to give you another, I'm going to be really candid with you and, uh, uh, and give you another example. Uh, what, based on my week last week, which was, um, laden with the surprise and, and, and some changes in, um, support staff, um, I also learned that I need to be in Dallas on Wednesday instead of just going to Florida on Thursday for a retreat that I'm going to speak at. So I've lost two preparation days. So instead of having all of Tuesday night and Wednesday and Thursday morning to prepare, now I need to be ready to fly out early Wednesday morning um, for, a, uh, for an advisory board meeting. And so I was really tempted not to do Facebook Live. In my mind, a couple of times, I, I thought, started thinking about the meme. Okay, the meme would say, um, uh, it's been rescheduled. 
and people would understand. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not good. Um, something came up. Oh, no, that's not good. Uh, there were, it, it was the battle in my mind. And so what I decided to do was just to breathe and breathe out. And I restructured my sticky notes and I replanned my preparation time. And it's still going to be really tight. And I'm sure I'll get it done because I have a history. We all have a history, do we not, of getting it done? Don't you get more done when you're ready to go on vacation than, you know, any other week before? Um, so what I decided to do was just to breathe and honor my commitment. And so um, I think lots of times when we get surprised, our reaction to that is, oh no, and then we kind of go into crazy mode and then everything falls apart because we don't find a way to blend in. Well, what can I do? What can I do? How can I adjust? And so um, I think viewing interruptions that way is super important. Okay, so here's some example of mission statement. Uh, this one's personal. I'm passionate about living my daily life grounded on the truth and power of my authority in Christ at peace that all is well. Creating a home environment, serenity, joy, comfort, love, peace in my home. I will work and play according to my values, keeping private integrity with my public word. Recognizing the gift and brevity of time, I will honor God each day as I prioritize people and tasks. Pray versus obsess or fix or worry make in the moment biblical golden rule choices and participate deeply and meaningfully in those lives of people most important to me. That's my personal one. Business one. I'm passionately, I'm passionate and about and devoted to mentoring, coaching, equipping leaders with desire and commitment to skill, growth, and accomplishment. I'm boldly committed to their increase and I hold the willing and accountable to their spoken goals. I proactively invest my time on women who follow through and keep integrity, who respond to my coaching, and who contribute to our area goals. I speak God's truth in practical application as souls are saved, hearts are changed, kingdom glory is increased, and I remain true and humble to his work through me, I fully obey. So I adjusted him a little bit in the past year because um, my son is at a different age and stage and so parenting shifted and so I adjusted them this last year to do, to do that. You'll find yours when you ask yourself those questions and you know, what do I value? What do I want? What is success to me? What do I want to be known by? How do I want to serve? When you ask yourself those questions and you write them out um, every single uh, time you do a 90 day planner, it will start to unfold. Okay. So if you think your friends would like this last part, I have talked too long, but I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to I'm going to hit affirmations instead of getting away from affirmations because I would I could end it now, but it's a really short version of affirmations, so I'm going to finish it up. Okay, so affirmations, a very short version. Your affirmation statements are statements of accomplishment that match your written and spoken goal. So your affirmation is a statement of accomplishment that matches your goal, okay? So I'm going to give you two of mine. I'm going to give you two of my affirmations, okay? They're the least transparent ones, but I'm going to give you two of them. Fair? <laughs> I mean, they're pretty transparent, but, you know, I'm going to give you two of them. Okay, number one. I live in an organized, comfortably luxurious, yet simple and minimal environment. Every room in the house is decluttered. I clear my office and desk each evening Clean my inbox, photos, and part easily with possessions others would be blessed to have. Okay? That's one. Here's another one. Two. I'm completely healthy and fit, physically active, five plus workouts a week, am sugar free, and enjoy whole healthy foods as a preference. I weigh 120 pounds with 13% body fat. I feel energetic, fit, sexy, and skinny when I maintain 120. Okay, now what's the deal with those affirmations? The deal with those affirmations is they both state the affirmative of a goal that I have. The first, the first one is to live in a decluttered environment, okay? An organized decluttered environment. I've lived in this house for 22 years. Jerry and I moved here from Florida with Thomas as a four-month-old 22 years ago. And it has three floors. And <laughs> uh, it, has, it has the accumulation factor. 
And so I have been decluttering, you know, for the past two years actively, but there's more decluttering to do. I, I feel I'm happy with pictures around me because right now I'm looking at pictures of people and friends and family and there's a safety in pictures around me, but it can also provide a clutter. So I want to affirm that and, and as part of my plan every week is to take two hours and just go room to room and declutter two hours a week. Do I always do that? No. But is it less cluttered than it ever has been? Yes. And I can think clearly and that's just it's just a, a goal that I want to accomplish. And I also don't want to be so married to stuff that I'm not willing to give it away. Um, and so that's another thing. Okay. The second one is about my workouts. Okay. So I used to work out and diet for a size. I, I, and I, I, thankfully, I've hit an age where that's not my goal. I mean, I love getting dressed. And y'all, I think I've told you this before, that the reason, one reason for me about, about being fit is fitting in my clothes is that being in events when I'm with people, I'm not thinking about me, like, oh, pulling stuff down and getting tight. You know, I'm not thinking about me. I can focus on just you. So for me, being fit, it's a lot about just feeling good in my skin, being energetic, and being able to focus on you when we're together, not my tight skirt, not you looking at me in my tight tight skirt. So that's, that, that, you know, that the goal of fitness includes, of course, a size that I feel best in in my skin. But notice what it said in the very beginning. I am completely healthy and fit. You know, I've lost people in my life um, to unforeseen illness and we all are not guaranteed tomorrow. I am healthy and fit and I'm standing on that and I'm telling my brain that and I'm running with that. Physically active. Five plus workouts a week and sugar free. If uh, there was a buy in in society, I would have a sugar addiction because sugar, when I eat sugar, it drives more sugar. Um, and only people who know this agree that it is an issue, but most people are like, ah. And people who have other addictions that the world acknowledges addiction don't like the conversation either because it's a different kind of thing. You know, I'm not going to die or kill someone tomorrow if I eat a cookie. But I also know that I'm not going to feel my best. I'm not going to think my clearest. I'm going to gain weight. It's going to be a spiral. I want to go for more. It messes up my, you know. You don't need to hear about me. But there is a history about this. I'm sugar-free. I just included it in my information. That's the point of telling you that. And I enjoy whole healthy foods as a preference. So that when I'm thinking I enjoy whole healthy foods as a preference, I'm not thinking I'm going to go make cookie dough when this is over. I'm thinking I'm going to make a turkey burger and broccolini and I've got a little bit of leftover sweet potato hash with apples and blueberries in it and that's what I'm going to have for dinner. So I prefer whole healthy foods as a habit. I weigh 120 pounds with 13% body fat. Okay, I don't. I weigh 127 pounds with 15% body fat. So you can hate me now. <laughs> but uh, my goal is still better. I still have a goal to improve. And so, um, and then I added a little cute little ditty at the end of it. I feel energetic, fit, sexy, and skinny when I maintain 120. Why? Because my brain is embracing that. Now, let me tell you this, okay? The emotional completion of an affirmation is bringing it all together. I feel energetic, fit, sexy, and skinny when I maintain 120. In the other one, it was, um, where'd it go, where'd it go, where'd it go, where'd it go? Um, and part easily with possessions others would be blessed to have. In other words, I'm not married to it. Part easily with possessions others would be blessed to have. So the emotional completion trains your focus. Unless you train your focus, you will never build your faith. You've got to frame your focus. Frame your focus. You've got to frame your focus. Focused reflection. When you say your affirmations and you're affirming the goals in the form of something that has happened, and you include the, it has to be not only the what, but it also has to be the action that will complete it. When there is alignment in your words, your actions and your thoughts, you have, you are truly have protein synthesis in your brain. It's literally changing the complexity of your brain. When there is cognitive dissonance, meaning that your words, your thoughts, and your actions are not in alignment, if that's the case, then there's cognitive dissonance and you constantly doubt yourself and you constantly don't believe yourself. So affirmations are the third part to goal setting. You've got the goal, the what and the why and the daily task and the in the moment what I want and need to do right now to accomplish this because the accumulation effect. 
See, what I do, uh, when, uh, when I do it over and over and over, it accumulates, that's the result that I get. So whereas we took the weight loss plan at the very beginning, that conversation, when I do this over and over and over and over and over and every week, I have a 3,500 or 7,000 calorie deficit based on activity and food, then when I, the accumulation effect of that will give me a different result. The same is true in your business, whether it's appointments or conversations or um, whatever it is that you're working on for your goal. So I've got the long-term the short term right now in the moment then I've got the affirmation to complete it when my affirmation that completes it also accompanies and includes an action then that focused reflection when I repeat those affirmations or when I listen to them on a smartphone or both I have mine on a smartphone and I have them laminated in the shower when I can literally physically read them and I can hear them and and utilize both of those learning tools and I'm changing my brain that completes the process of, of making uh, making the goal a reality imagining builds physical thoughts research shows that physical thought thinking about an action activates the same region of the brain as actually carrying out that same action or process. It goes back to a biblical truth. Nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Nothing they've imagined they can do will be impossible for them. It's the great capacity of how God designed us. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So rehearsing things mentally affects the way you actually do daily things. When, when I say I prefer whole healthy foods as a habit, when it's time for me to eat, my brain's telling me I prefer whole healthy foods as a habit. Here's an apple. Here's <laughs> See where I'm going with that? So each time you think it through, you change the memory. Every time you think it through, you change the memory. And there's protein synthesis creating that new memory and that new pattern for you because your brain is working with you. Just like a surgeon before an operation is going to think through the operation or a student before a big test is going to think through the answers to a test or an athlete before a game or a match did you watch the Olympics and did you watch the uh, uh, athletes sit and think through their routines or their swim or last year's Super Bowl Peyton Manning did you see him think through that you could see that thinking through just like any of those people surgeon student or athlete would think through a process or procedure your own mental rehearsal the newly built memory gets stronger and it builds more connections in the wiring of your brain. Literally, with neighboring nerve cells integrating throughout um, and, and it will completely uh, integrate a new thought and a new thought pattern. Have you ever found yourself rehearsing a thought over and over and over in your mind for days like you couldn't get it out of your head maybe it's a conversation you're gonna have with somebody and you're gonna punch somebody kind of deal it's not necessarily uh, a positive thought or scenario has that ever happened to you You're just kind of going through your head well a toxic thought or a healthy thought can be built with mental rehearsal dr. Caroline leaf neuroscientist says that you can tear toxic strongholds down you can build a healthy thought up you can tear toxic ones down you can build healthy ones up every cell in your body is affected by your thoughts your heart is in constant communication with your brain and the rest of your body focused reflection or these affirmations focused reflection listening to them reading them it takes you beyond storing facts rather you store key concepts and strategies that you've put together and then you come up with your own answers in the moment in the moment when it's crunch time these are a few of the benefits of affirmations. It's taking control of your thoughts, capturing your thoughts, renewing your mind. Otherwise, the noise around you, OPT, other people's thoughts, whoo, there's a lot of thoughts rolling around these days, aren't there? <laughs> So if you don't take charge of your own thoughts, OPT's thoughts, OPT, other people's thoughts, they get loud and that's a lot of noise. The news, whoo, goodness gracious, that would be a horrific mistake today. So you're never doing them wrong. That's, that, that's the reason I wanted to hit these is because people say, I'm afraid I'm doing my affirmations wrong. You're never doing them wrong. If you're framing the positive version of the outcome you desire to match the prayerful goal that you've set. You're retraining your brain when you agree on that direction. But when you say the affirmation, the completion of the goal that you set, it also has to include action to accompany it. So that you're not only saying, you know, I earn blank doll, you know, whatever, a week or a month. 
because I blank, blank, blank. So set an affirmation for each of the goals that you've set. An affirmation followed by action brings actuality. Affirmation plus action is actuality. Put them on your smartphone. Listen to them in the morning after your quiet time, prayer, meditation, journaling. If you're really committed, record some evening affirmations to free your mind and to fully rest and sleep. If you have set up your design book for the day, the half hour at a time planning appointments with yourself and others, if you have aligned your plans, uh, wake time, nutrition and exercise and work habits to be a positive accumulative math factor towards your 90 days, then you can rest. If you've already set all that up before you go to bed, it's all written out there, then you can rest without your brain jumping all over the place. So mine does say, I've set, out my, I've, I've set up my design book for tomorrow. I know exactly what I'm doing when I wake up. Um, everything is set out for my quiet time. The coffee is preset. I've accomplished everything I needed to accomplish. Tonight, I'm gonna get at least um, X number hours sleep, and that's exactly what my body needs. And if, if it was four, I would convince myself that four is what I need. I, I'm, I have the luxury of getting at least eight most, most nights, not, not the next few days, but most nights. And um, But whatever it is, it's. A, it's going to agree with that. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been beneficial. If you haven't yet, share this. Hit your share button on your phone or your computer to your Facebook wall and your family and friends. And for lessons like this and other ones like this, if you're new to what we're going with, please visit me at PamelaShaw.Pink. There you can sign up for our mailing list and um, you can get a 90-day planner if you don't have one or you'd like one or like to get one for a friend. So until next time, remember, you're not living a life someone else assigned to you. You're living life on your own design. Not fully pleased, you know what? Your success blesses others. If you're not fully pleased, design your life. God bless you. God's you. Have a great week, everybody.